are we starting the sixth mass extinction? That's a question that we really have to discuss. And for that discussion, we here at ZenkTech, I'm Jay Fidel, and the, our discussion today is on community matters. We're going to discuss that with Dr. Robert Cowie of the Pacific Biosciences Research Center at UH Manoa. Welcome to the show, Robert. Oh, nice to be here. So you were in the paper not too long ago about the sixth mass extinction. And um, that's enough to make you, you know, turn your head a little, what, 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 what's going on here? Um, but it's not happening right now. Uh, I guess the issue is, um, is it happening soon? Can you give us a, a, a precis on what it is, this mass extinction we should expect? So there have been five mass extinctions prior to what this one might become. Um, and the, the rule of thumb is that that means that 75% of all species on Earth vanish. That's the sort of rule of thumb definition of a mass extinction. This one is different from the previous ones because this one is entirely caused by humans, human activities. And at this point, we can't say that the sixth mass extinction has happened, or even perhaps that it is happening, because you can't say that it's that we've reached seventy-five percent of species going extinct until it's actually happened, right? And so, we, what we said in the um, in the paper that was recently published that attracted a lot of media attention was that, well, at the rate we're going right now, and we estimated that rate of extinction. At the rate we're going right now, then at some point in the perhaps not too distant future, particularly as the rate increases, we will probably come to a mass extinction. At this point, we would say that we're probably at the start of it. So what? Uh, so if 75 percent. Uh, is a sort of a benchmark. What, what, where are we now? Are we at 1%, 2%, 5%? Where are we? We're at maybe 10%. Ooh. Uh, because, yes. Um, and the numbers that we extrapolated um, based on some research of our own that we did a few years ago um, suggested that between 150,000 and 260,000. So, so give or take 200,000 species with a bit of sloth either way um, have gone extinct already since the year 1500. And I can explain why the year 1500, if, you, if you're interested in a moment. Yes, um, please. Uh, well, let, let, let me come back to that because um, the point of that, two, that roughly two, 200,000 species going extinct since 1500 is that that as a proportion of the known species that exist on Earth, those that we've found and, and described and given names to, scientific names to, there are about 200, there are about 2 million of those. Out of maybe 10 million total species, the rest that we don't know exist yet, we're just estimating that. But of those 2 million species, we estimate that around 200,000 have already gone extinct. So that's around 10%. That, that's, that's a striking number. Um, and a, a lot of those species are, are not, not the elephants and the tigers and so on that everyone hears about being really critically endangered. Um, but it's all the things that we don't know so much about, the little creepy crawlies and so on, that, that are uh, myriads of them in the Amazon jungle um, that's not been explored and it's being destroyed as we speak. So it's a dramatic number. So um, you know, I'm thinking of um, a, a British uh, scientist uh, who's in the media a lot. He's made some movies. David, I want to say David Atten Attenborough. Yeah, yeah. I, I met him at the Bishop Museum uh, oh, 20 odd years ago when he was filming, um, filming the land snails, uh, the, the Hawaiian land snails, tree snails that uh, he was making a, um, a, little, a little tiny section of one of his Life on Earth movies or not like yes. one, of the, one of that ill. Well, one thing that he always, always says and repeats and repeats is that <clears throat> it's all interdependent. And if you uh, lose a species or a group of species, 
um, that's going to have an effect on other species. And it's not in a silo. It's all connected in many, many ways. Um, and I guess that's, that's, uh, that's the general knowledge. That's the general point. And so if we have lost 200,000 uh, species in the world today, how, how would you say, looking back, looking back to 1500, how has that affected us? Oh, well, that's a really difficult question because no, and no one's really, I think, tried to answer that. Um, we can speculate, you know, a lot of those 200,000 um, species are going to be, like I mentioned, the, the little creepy crawlies in the jungle somewhere. Um, and the issue there is to, you've undoubtedly heard the analogy of the, a, a plane uh, losing a rivet here and there still carries on flying. Um, so it, func it still functions as a flying plane, even though it's lost a couple of rivets here and there. Now it'll lose a couple more, and now it'll lose a couple more, but eventually it'll come to a point where it falls out of the sky, right? And so I think that there's probably a lot of redundancy among species out there in terms of what their functions are, um, but their functions ultimately are, including the functions of these little, little creepy crawly slugs and snails, which is what I work on, and insects, myriads of insects and spiders and beetles and et cetera, et cetera. Um, as swaths of them disappear, then ecosystem function is ultimately damaged. And I had a, a graduate student some years ago, um, Marty Meyer, and he published a couple of papers in, in which he described some experiments that he'd done in what we call mesocosms, they're like cages that he set out in the rainforest in, on the Big Island. And uh, what he showed was that the, the snails in particular, the snails were responsible for, I think it was something like 30% of the turnover of nutrients in the system. And um, I mean, he was unfortunately having to work with non-native snails because those were what were abundant in the, in the rainforest, the native ones disappeared. Perhaps those non-native ones were um, fulfilling the roles that some of the native ones previously did. But since we don't know what the roles of the previous ones were, uh, we now know what the roles of the, of the invasive ones that he worked on are. Um, we can't really um, say whether they have fulfilled those roles or not. And so it's very, that comes back to what I started off by saying, is that it's very, very difficult to, to say what's changed since we don't really know in sufficient detail. Yeah, we know that there were snails there, but we don't know what they did exactly. Um, because snails don't all do the same, eight different things. And they, they, um, same with insects and so on. And so, yeah, you can, you can probably say that if some, um, top predator goes extinct, then, um, then there's a big eco ecosystem impact. So for instance, when, when wolves are extirpated, okay, gray wolves are not extinct yet, but they're also, they're, they're considered endangered, even though the Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't acknowledge that anymore. Um, when wolves are extirpated from a particular area, then the deer increase in numbers and they eat more of the veget vegetation, the, the, the leaves on the trees, and the, and the flora, the tree flora changes dramatically. And that's because the wolves have disappeared. So if wolves go extinct across the, a whole swath of Northern North America, then maybe there's gonna be some um, regional change in, in, in flora. Um, so things like that um, can, can, can occur, I think. But, but like I say, it's very, very difficult to say how things have changed since 1500. We can look at how environments have changed, how humans have impacted environments, but is, that be, is the change specifically related to the, to the loss of particular species or group of species? That's very, very clear to say. Well, that's so interesting. And, and it, you know, it, it, it begs to say, this is very, very complex. Um, more, and the more you find, the more you need to find, the more you know, the more you need to know. Um, it's our whole world. It is our whole world. 
But you know, it, it reminds me when you talk about snails on the Big Island. I think of rat rat lungworm, uh, and I know you were on our shows a few years ago to discuss that. Um, so I say to myself, well, rat lungworm could be eradicated if you just uh, eradicated the snails. Maybe I'm wrong, but that that's part of the life cycle of the of the of the worm. Um, on the other hand, if you eradicated the snails, you'd have other implications. You'd have other <clears throat> subtle effects, maybe not so subtle effects on the flora and the fauna. The same thing with uh, other other uh, organisms that carry pathogens or that are pathogenic. I mean, we are always tempted to eradicate them to avoid the pathogen, like mosquitoes uh, carrying any number of mosquito diseases. Um, but if we do that, if we knock out a particular species or group of species of, um, of mosquitoes, we'll pay a price in some other way. And, and that all begs for further research, doesn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think specifically with the mosquito issue, there's actually a group of people um, heavily engaged right now here at UH in developing potential control measures for very sophisticated genetic approaches um, for the control of mosquitoes here in Hawaii, um, because for, for the exact reasons that you mentioned. Um, the, the difference here is that those mosquitoes were not native. And they've come here, they, they're a menace to us. We don't like getting bitten by mosquitoes and they carry disease. But they also have caused the extinction um, of a number of native Hawaiian bird species, of course. And, and so there are multiple, multiple ramifications of having mosquitoes here in Hawaii. Um, but you could argue that getting rid of them is reverting the, the environment back to where it should be, perhaps, or where it was at some point in history, prior to the introduction of mosquitoes, which are non, not native here. So, you know, it's, very, it's complex. It's complex socially as well. Yeah, and that's and that, sure. Uh, but but uh, and I want to hear about the social part, but uh, it just strikes me that biology, which is your field of study, is not static, um, that you have to not, it's beyond looking at the ecosystem now, today, and all those millions of connections and effects of, you know, the, so the, those domino effects of, you know, um, acting on one thing in the environment and having all this secondary effect. It's more than that. It's you got to look back historically, like taking a slice off a tree. Um, to, to see what it was like in 1500 and 1600 and so forth. And then also you have to look forward. Uh, you have to look forward to that 75% of the mass extinction, which I want to ask you about. But you said social implications. Tell us about the social implications. It's kind of related to the social implications, but there are people here, and we discussed this in the paper, um, who, not just here in Hawaii, in, in, in the world, who, who think that, oh, let me back up. I think that this crisis is horrendous. And I think that we should be doing something dramatic to try to stave it off. I mean, I'm very pessimistic about that. I don't think the social aspects of it, I don't think there's the political, economic, societal will to actually do that. It's, it would require huge changes. I don't even know if I'm prepared to um, suffer the, 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 the hardships, if you will, <laughs> to exaggerate perhaps, that would be required to, you know, reduce my carbon footprint, for instance. Um, you know, there are people better than me who have, who are able to do that. But, but anyway, that's, that's one thing. The, there are people who, unlike me, don't actually care. Uh, there are people who think, well, you know, Humans are just animals. We, we evolved from some other humanoid animal, ultimately. And of course, some people don't believe that, but that's a whole other story. Um, so we did evolve and they say, well, we're continuing to evolve. Just, we're just another animal doing its thing in the great sort of evolutionary maelstrom. <laughs> Evolving into extinction. <laughs> well, quite possibly. But the thing is, they think it's okay because they think that they don't think that humans are going to go extinct. They think that we're just doing our own thing 
and that's evolution. And if, and if human evolution means that 75% of biodiversity on Earth disappears, then so be it. That's just, that's just the way nature works in the, in the greatest scheme of things. Mm. There are other people who go so far as to not only say, that's a, that's a sort of laissez-faire attitude. The other, there are other people who take an active attitude in which they think that, um, sure, there's a biodiversity crisis. Great, let's, let's manipulate it for our own benefit. Um, and who's going to define that benefit? That's a big question for me. Um, and actually, the answer is probably fairly straightforward. It's going to be politicians and economists, and business people, not people like me who, who don't have any kind of or very little influence over uh, over those aspects of well, that sounds like exploitation, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Uh, but they but they're fine with that because their their focus is to is the benefit of humanity, whatever that means. Um, and there are some benefits that are talked about, like you know, um, developing countries um, increasing their GDP or whatever the economic things are that uh, allow those people to have. Uh, the kinds of lives that we have um, and you know maybe that's a good thing um, but uh, doesn't this run a parallel to the dichotomy of, of social thought over climate change in general <laughs> there's a lot of people that uh, you know either deny it or say well you know that's the way it goes maybe it'll return in another million years to to the way it was we, we we can't do anything about it so we won't worry about it or if it gets worse it won't affect us it'll affect our children same thing with mass extinction if it gets worse it won't affect us it'll affect our children and they will have better science then to deal with it which it may or may not be true um but, but can you talk about that the comparison of the social response to this notion of extinction and the social response to the notion of climate change. Like, like you've implicate, implied, it's very similar. It's all ultimately about this whole science denial thing. Um, they're denying that there's climate change or they're saying, like you said, it'll go away. It's just the natural cycle of, of the climate, the Earth's climate. Um, just like I just described about, uh, well, it's just humans, be, humans evolving and this is what humans do when they evolve. Um, I think that the, the whole science denial thing is, is very scary. Um, and, you know, not just climate change and biodiversity extinction, it's, it's COVID, vaccination, that's everything that we talk about in the news right now. Um, there's, I'll tell you, tell you a funny story. Um, when this paper first came out and we released the, the new H released press release, um, one of the first people to, to tweet was, and it, this was in response to a tweet actually about our paper, was Elon Musk. And he tweeted basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, he tweeted saying, yeah, everything is going to go extinct eventually when the, when, the, when the sun expands and eats up the earth, including humans. So, so we, need to go to, we need to become interplanetary. <laughs> and, I thought, <laughs> and I thought, this is just, it's piggybacking on our paper to, to self-serve and get people to support his space exploration. Because, you know, you know, you know when the sun's gonna, going to um, engulf the Earth? Five billion years from now. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's all out of science fiction, but it may or may not be true. Science fiction changes. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things uh, that you mentioned I'd like to inquire about. Number one is, um, uh, th this may be a hard question, I'm not sure, but we have a continuum here at, say, 10% uh, extinction now, um, and uh, say 75%, where it really gets, you know, destructive. Um, what is it like if I wake up one morning at 75% extinction, what kind of a world do we have with 75% extinction? What we'll have, and sure it's speculation, but we're on the road to this already, we know that. And Hawaii is a microcosm of this. Um, if you think about it, before any people arrived here in Hawaii, there were all those birds that have now gone extinct. 
There were all those plants that have now gone extinct. There were all the snails that have gone extinct. And most, most of, obviously the, the, the original Polynesian people who arrived here caused some of that because of course they had to um, uh, uh, make way for their agriculture, for their habitations and so on. Um, but it ramped up once, once Europeans, Westerners, Europeans, Americans, what have you, got here. And it's continued to ramp up. And we published a paper back in 2015 about a group of snails, um, a family of snails, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian snails that are only found here in Hawaii. In this group, which is called a family, there are three, there were 325 species. And we now think that of those 325, only maybe about 20 are left alive. So there you've got more than 75%, but that's just within that one group. And it's not at all clear what that group did or didn't do that is different now because the habitats all changed anyway. Um, so what's happened here is, first of all, we've got all that, that extinction, but then we've got a lot of invasive species here. You've heard the expression endangered species capital of the world, also the invasive species capital of the world. And so everything's changed here. The faunas, the floras um, of the islands. What's left of the original um, ecosystems and plants and animals are mostly confined to the, high, not entirely, but mostly confined to high elevation um, mountain tops and so on. What's down below, I mean, we never see, we never see a native bird in our yard. Um, we never see a native snail in our yard. We've just got bulbuls and miners and slugs. Um, and so we're already seeing what it's like to have some loss of native biodiversity and its replacement by other plants and animals. Most of those animals, which is what I know more about, but plants too, um, are species that are not Obviously, they're not just native to Hawaii and nowhere else because they come from somewhere else. But these are species like the giant African snail, which everybody knows, um, that are now pretty much all over the tropics. Um, and so what you have having is a homogenization of faunas and floras. So replacement of and the Pacific Islands are classic, the classic example of this, not just Hawaii, but all the islands of the Pacific, where you had the snails, for instance, you had maybe 5,000 different species of snails, each living on a single island or on a small archipelago. archipelago. Those, are being those are disappearing and those are being replaced by half a dozen or 10 or 15 non-native snails introduced by people that have now spread all over the Pacific. So the fauna has become significantly homogeneous across the islands of the Pacific, whereas, whereas before it was very diverse with local endemic so-called species. Um, and What's so wrong with homogeneity? Um, I, I mean, I, certainly people are, uh, I don't know if nostalgic is the right word, but they hearken back to a day when Hawaii was uh, more isolated and, and had its own ecology and it was different than anywhere in the world. And now we're be, becoming homo Genius, uh, 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 genius, and so um, what's bad about that? What have we lost, and and what has replaced it in terms of a, a benefit to humanity? Okay, I think that an, an issue that we haven't touched on is benefit to humanity simply in terms of the joy and the the pleasure we get from not just seeing nature, but knowing that diverse nature exists out there. I mean, to, 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 to exaggerate a bit, how would you like your grandchildren not to be able to see a live tiger, even a tiger in a zoo, because tigers have disappeared. And we feel the same about these little, little, little things. The snails that we work on, this group that I published the paper with, these snails are going extinct at a rate of knots, and, and particularly across the islands of the Pacific. And so what we, at the end of the paper, exhorted scientists like me, I'm too old, I can't hike anymore, um, but um, <laughs> other, other younger people who can do heavy duty field work, 
to get out there and collect representative examples of every single species that they can find, particularly the ones that have never been described before. And there's a truckload of those out there that are already going extinct. We're finding them already extinct. We're finding the shells. Um, and so collect them, put them in museum collections. It may take 300 years to actually descri describe and name them all, but at least they'll be there so that ultimately 200 years, 300 years, 500 years from now, those, our, our descendants would be able to see all those snails. And it could be, it could be lions, it could be elephants, it could be rhinoceroses, it could be birds of paradise, whatever. And know that once upon a time, there was this spectacular diversity living on earth that we've unfortunately lost. And I think that maybe that's an emotional response, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a um, tropical garden, tropical preserve um, in Manoa, uh, up the back of the valley there. I forget the exact scientific term of it. And they, they save things. They save plants that no longer have a, um, you know, a, 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 an environment in which they can survive. Uh, with the notion that part one UH, day, huh? Part of the UH, the Lion Arboretum is what you think. That's it. Yeah. Uh, we had we had a show there once a few years ago, uh -huh. and what I remember it was a very interesting notion that one day we would take all these plants that we were saving, carefully, carefully saving in the arboretum, and return them to the environment that would be nutritious for them if it ever came back. But it wasn't clear that that environment would ever be available again. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Is that a worthy effort? I think I think I I do think it's a worthy effort, and we're doing the same with the snails. That um, the DLNR and the Bishop Museum both have um, big big captive rearing, captive breeding populations of native Hawaiian snails. That and the goal is to get them back out in the field eventually. And the DLNR, along with the army. <clears throat> Uh, people who own a lot of the land on Oahu are actually doing that in a limited way by putting them out in predator-free exclosures. So these are fences around an area of habitat that's suitable for the snails, and it keeps out the various predators that are one of the major causes of um, the extinction of these things. So. It's, it's, it seems like pie in the sky to, to hope that things will go back to normal. Well, not normal, but what's normal? But back to um, sort of more native habitats. But it's not inconceivable if there were a will, at least in small areas, to do that. I mean, I think that New Zealand does, New Zealand does a great job in some, in some of these regards. I saw, I went to a native, uh, a nature reserve there, right in the center of Wellington almost, that has been completely fenced off. You have to go through double doors to get to it, like a like a you know air, air thing. Um, yeah, like a tropical disease laboratory. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know they had all these native it was native plants and native animals, things that had been extirpated from everywhere else in, the, in that area. And so I think it's not entirely pie, pie in the sky, but there has to be a will. And that's, that's what is the problem. Well, that, that takes us to the study of biology in general. I mean, we, we talk about this very complex uh, global ecosystem, which is being homogenized as we speak, and we're losing you know, various elements of it. And we don't know what, that, what the cost is to lose those elements. And then we have biologists like you who, um, who see this happening, and you're, you know, you're you're not the man on the street, you're a scientist. And the man on the street doesn't know about this. And, and then ultimately, maybe biology will get to be a science that will um, be able to preserve um, these um, species, be able to understand more completely how each one affects the other, and thus to save the planet, save the biodiversity from extinction. I mean, do you see biology and what you do in biosciences as a science that can actually uh, affect scientifically this mass diversity extinction? I, I can, but I don't think I can see it. I can see the way to do that. I mean, like, even if it's just by collecting a whole lot of 
stuff that will ultimately go extinct so that at least we know what was here once. There's lots of other good projects, conservation projects out there, like the Bishop Museum efforts and the DLNR efforts. And globally, you know, people are trying to save rhinoceroses and tigers and whales and what have you. Um, and those are all laudable efforts. And, to, you know, we need to do that um, because some of those will be successful, at least, at least over the short term, and maybe things will change a little bit um, as time goes by. But I, the reason I think that we should collect stuff um, and put them in museums is because I'm ultimately pessimistic that there are biologists who want to do this and there are biologists who probably could do this, but not enough of them, of course, but is there a societal will to do it? That's the, that's the $64,000 question, um, because without that societal will, which means the money, it all follow the money, um, it needs money, and it's not, not a thing. Well, I mean, if you, if you make a comparison to climate change, we yeah. seem to have a problem in finding, you know, the, the collective will to address the phenomenon. <laughs> and so that, that brings me to one more question I would like to discuss with you. And that is, um, when you say that at 75%, um, we, that is the, I guess the human species is extinct. That's pretty serious. No, I didn't say that. Um, okay, wait, sorry. Um, uh, I are we at risk of becoming extinct? Sure. And how does that work? I think we are at risk, um, ultimately, because depending on when that 75% mark is reached, and, that, and that's a silly arbitrary number, um, but uh, whenever that's reached, um, probably ecosystems are going to be, will have been changed dramatically. Um, a whole load of, and we're not just talking animals, but plants in terms of what goes extinct. Certain species of plants go extinct, you know, watersheds get damaged. Um, We've, got a, we've still got a, a, an expanding global human population that's, that's craving water, and the water's disappearing for not only these kinds of reasons, but because of climate change reasons and so on and so forth. So like you say, it's all interconnected. Um, and ultimately, you know, it could come crashing down. And um, I think that if, this is terribly pessimistic to say, but it seems to me that the way that we're going to go extinct is because we're all going to fight each other and kill each other. <laughs> okay. That could happen a lot sooner. <laughs> well, um, but I think that that's, that's ultimately how we'll go extinct because, and I don't think technology is going to solve these problems. I think technology is, if people think that that's going to happen, then I, then I think they're, they're in a, a dream world. So one, one more thing related to that, um, you know, the sixth mass extinction you mentioned early and, and I saw in the summary of your paper is different <clears throat> than the previous five. Um, how far did the previous five get um, before they somehow stopped? And what was the effect on the uh, you know, global environment of each? Um, and have we been sort of stepping down into a a lesser environment with each one of these five? Uh, what, happen what happens is that um, there's some cataclysmic change in climate, for instance, or, or there's a sudden huge um, uh, volcanic um, eruption on a grand scale. Um, one of these was uh, way back in, one of these extinctions was in, caused by volcanic activity in India. And of course, the, the fifth extinction, which is when the dinosaurs went extinct, um, was caused by a, um, an asteroid landing in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Um, at least that's the, that's the generally accepted theory. And that was like uh, 100 nuclear bombs going off and um, causing huge, huge um, change in climate um, as a result of the, the whole place being clouded over um, and so on. And that's the basic thinking on that. Um, other than that one, the previous four mass extinctions were largely um, constrained to marine environments, uh, or at least they're defined by marine environments. So it's a lot of marine invertebrates going extinct is what uh, defined the previous four mass extinctions. And it's thought that those were 
probably caused by things like volcanism changing the atmosphere, carbon dioxide levels increasing, acidity in the oceans increasing, those, those kinds of those kinds of earth chemistry changes happening. Um, I'm not an expert in those, in those areas. Um, that's the geologist's domain. Um, but what little I know is that actually that's that's how it all changed. And it was, these things resulted in climatic changes, raised temperatures or lowered temperatures, and those um, caused those uh, seasons. I mean, well, is it fair to say that the human species is actually a result? Of of the of these previous extinction stages. Well, of course, because you know when the dinosaurs went extinct, that made way for evolution of large diversity of larger mammals, of which we're the product. And and is it fair to say uh, that the the species will survive the sixth extinction, or is that so different? I mean, aside from the possibility of war and self-destruction, uh, is that I, I so different? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, is it so? Is it so profound? The sixth one that we're talking about. You wrote your article about um, the sixth one will do us in, or ultimately will create an environment in which we cannot survive as the human species. I don't feel qualified to give you a great answer on that. I think that it's, I don't think anyone knows how it's going to pan out in sufficient detail in terms of what goes extinct, what doesn't go extinct, what environmental changes take place um, as a result of those extinctions, uh, interacting, of course, with climate change. Um, but to be able to say, yes, we'll go extinct or we'll decline and our you know, we'll go back to sort of living in mud huts and uh, what have you, or in caves or whatever, um, or whether we find the technology, and I don't think that's going to happen, to, to fix ourselves somehow, to fix the environment, to, to make it habitable um, in a good way for humans. So it, it's, it's, I don't think it's possible to say um, how it's going to pan out at this point. A lot won't of be for, it won't be for a while, though. No, uh, we're not going to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I told you before we started that I, that I loved biology in high school, and, uh, and all my friends did, too. And my last question to you, Robert, is, um, <clears throat> is, it, is it more um, appealing now than it was? Is biology something that any viewer of this program should consider studying? Sure. There's, there's all sorts of fascinating stuff in biology. It's, a, it's for example, um, you've heard of the microbiome. You've probably had microbiome people on your, on your show before now. Um, that's the new frontier in biology, one can argue. Um, so we don't understand the vast, the vast majority of what the importance of the microbiome is in not only just in our own bodies, but in other animals, in ecosystems, in the ocean, what have you. Um, I think there's, there's wide open frontiers in biology, and it, that can be exciting. You know, I've spent, what, I've spent nearly 50 years uh, as a professional biologist. Um, no, not quite, not that long. Um, uh, but getting on for. And to be honest, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I still enjoy it. I still am fascinated. Ultimately, I'm fascinated by animals. That's what it boils down to. That's been the driving force of my career. I'm fascinated by animals. Um, it reminds me of um, the French headline after 9-11, I can't do I can't do exactly the right pronunciation. It was something like uh, uh, "Newsoms to Newsoms to the American." We are all American, and um, the, the reason it reminds me of that is I think to some extent all of us, whether we studied uh, biology in high school, college, or graduate school, we are all biologists. We live in a world of biology, and we really have to see it that way. But you can't avoid it. Yeah. 
We eat, we eat it, we eat it, we get diseases from it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Robert Cowie, uh, UH uh, Biosciences Research Center. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. That's been fun. Thank you. Aloha. 